So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lynn Barbie, and um, I live just up town city. I live just up the street from Lake County Public Library and have been there many, many times, especially when my kids were young. Um, I have been a horticulturist, I want to say, and in the retail garden industry for about 26 years now. The last 21 years have been at Home Depot. So I've answered questions about weed control um, all day long during the summertime in particular. Um, so we'll have questions and answers at the end, but if, if I, something's not clear along the way, feel free to uh, interrupt. I think you could press the space bar on your laptop and that should unmute you. Um, this picture, by the way, is what um, English Ivy will do. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't intended to be a weed, but it has sure become a weed and is um, I, it's on the invasive species list or very close to it. Um, so anyway, okay, we'll move on. So first of all, when a customer comes to the store, uh, and I say, I jokingly say, a customer will bring me some weed. I, I mean, a piece of weed, I wanna clarify, a piece of weed and they'll say, what is this? Uh, and how do, I, how do I get rid of this? And sometimes it doesn't really matter what it is so much, as long as you know the classifications because the weed control products um, are specific as to what they will kill. So basically, it either looks like a grass or it doesn't. The ones that look like grasses are called grassy weeds, duh. And the ones that don't look like grass are considered broadleaf weeds because they have broader leaves. And, um, and the chemicals that you would use to, if, if you choose to spray would be specific as to um, whether it's a broadleaf or a grassy weed. Now there are some weeds that are, are sedges actually and if you take a piece of grass, it'll look like a grass, but if you roll it between your fingers, it'll, you'll notice a three-sided stem, that's a sedge. And so sometimes grassy weeds will look like, you know, uh, will look like grass, but they're, they're sedges. And then there are products specifically aimed for sedges. They're not as common, I don't think, around here. So there again, it doesn't matter what you're dealing with as long as you know which of the two that it is. Those are the most common. So now you notice in the bottom corner, I've got this, those four colors and that's for a specific reason. A lot of um, lawn care companies have a four step program. And the first step you will usually be dealing with cr crabgrass. They're all fertilizer, but they have crab, they have different things added to them to deal with weeds. Um, so grassy weeds, it, like crabgrass, for example, is an annual, it's gonna die at the end of the season anyway. So if you use a crabgrass prevention in that first step or some other weed prevention product um, early in the spring, you've got you've to do it early, like let's say March, and you'll start seeing all those things advertised around that time because the marketers know that that's when you should be applying it and they'll put it out there earlier, uh, earlier than it's even needed in order to get your sale. So it's an annual. If you haven't treated crabgrass right as of yet, it's probably a little late now. Um, and so you could just wait at the end of the year, it will die. And then you could think about preventing it next year, okay? A thick lawn will often prevent, like if you fertilize your lawn and have a good healthy lawn, uh, you will often crowd out crabgrass. So then there's the broadleaf weeds. That's what the step two is. And I don't mean to insinuate that you have to use four steps. I don't use any fertilizer on my lawn, but then my lawn is not a showcase necessarily either. Um, I use, uh, my, no, my neighbor mows for me and, we, and even when I did it, we just left the grass clippings so that everything that your lawn used to make, to grow the lawn, all that goes back into the soil to uh, recycle and all those nutrients go back in. So broadleaf weeds can be perennials like dandelions. If you don't pull out the entire root of a dandelion, it'll just keep coming back. And the same thing with creeping Charlie and some of those. Now there are some, some broadleaf weeds that are annual. They grow from seed. And then at the end of the year, they'll die. They might reseed. Um, and you could be treat the, like I said, when it came to the grassy weeds, you treat that by prevention early in March. When it comes to the broadleaf weeds, you treat that as a post-emergent or a pre-emergent. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna go with the other steps. They usually have insect control. Sometimes you can find a weed control in the lawn in the, for fall. Fall is actually a really good time to, prevent, uh, to control weeds because um, 
those perennial weeds, not the annuals, they're gonna die anyway, but the perennials will be like a bear hibernating for the winter and they'll wanna eat and they'll absorb all the weed killer along with their food down into their system. Um, so let's talk about pre-emergent. That's my favorite way to treat weeds. Um, it All it does, and, and I'm going to mention, I do I have a picture here, maybe not. Uh, the, the, the product that's probably the most common, the most well-known, and I don't really wanna get into names specifically, although you will see some pictures and things. Uh, it's not so much the brand name, but I'm gonna show you some things that you're probably gonna be most familiar with. A pre-emergent interferes with the germination of seeds. So it only works on seeds and therefore you have to get it on your landscaping before the seeds sprout. It doesn't kill anything and it doesn't kill roots or anything. And so you have to know what you're dealing with. Again, always read the label. Uh, I might repeat that again. <laughs> but anyway, preen is probably the most common one. And I thought I had a picture in here, but um, maybe it'll be coming up next. Comes in a big yellow can. Uh, Trifluralan, I think is, or Treflan are the, the generic names. Just like when it comes to um, painkillers, for example, Aleve and those also have the, the common name or the, um, the chemical name. I don't know what the word I'm looking for is right now, uh, but those same things like uh, acetaminophen goes by different names, Tylenol or whatever. It's the same way with these uh, weed killers. So preen has to also be put down very early in the spring, or let's say if you make a new garden today, you're doing new landscaping today, then go ahead and get that on as soon as possible. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, so that, uh, it, you also have to decide if you wanna kill everything. So we've talked about uh, broadleaf weeds and also grassy weeds in some cases. And I'm going to be honest and tell you, this is my patio or was my patio. I, had, I live in an old house um, I had a concrete patio that had been removed. And in one season before I could, after the concrete came out, this is what popped up in one season. And that's because a lot of that was annual weeds that dropped from seed and from uh, the, the wind carries it, birds carry it, uh, and annual weeds. And sometimes it's just in the soil, those seeds are already there. So if, if I had, probably if I would have put some kind of pre-emergent on right away, I would have prevented a lot of that. But in this case, I just wanted to get rid of it because I did not plan on putting a new patio on top of it. It was an old concrete patio, about 15 feet square. And, um, and I had those flagstones uh, just for the time being. So if you wanna kill everything that's called a non-selective, it doesn't select, it doesn't pick just broadly or just grassy weeds, it kills everything. Glyphosate is probably the most common. Uh, there again, glyphosate is the, um, the name of the chemical. You probably have heard about it as Roundup. Uh, it might be in other products as well. There's also a, an extended control product like that. Um, when I say use good judgment, I say that because I don't like to see people use herbicides unnecessarily. Uh, not good for the environment. We have uh, beneficial insects and uh, birds and things who, who will... Uh, forage, um, even on weeds, you know, we, we think they're worthless, but uh, <laughs> nature doesn't think so. Um, so that's why I like preventing, because if you were to go in here every year and just like wantonly spray something to kill it, it we better just to prevent them from the first place. So then you're looking at, oh, but well, you probably recognize some of these things. <laughs> uh, some of these plants, we've got clover, uh, creeping charlie, Wood sorrel, I think. Let's see, what is this in the upper corner here? Uh, I can't think of the names of it. I can't think of the names of all these. Oh, I got the names. Violets, clover, chickweed, creeping charlie, and the one that I can't read. Um, but yeah, there are products. The, these things are hard to get rid of, and you've probably tried that. I had a customer one time who said, I spent $500 trying to get rid of Creeping Charlie in my backyard. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend that my, my money that way. That's why I, I tend to just ignore it. My neighbor probably doesn't like that, but you know, that's the way it is because they're really hard to kill. So there are products that are labeled specifically for hard to kill weeds. And, um, and I've got a slide showing you what that is here in a little bit. But this one here, I think is this one henbit and dead nettle. I'm gonna get them backwards now. And, um, 
and this one. These are all, so those are all hard to kill weeds. You know what that one is in the bottom right corner there? Anybody recognize that? That's just good old mint. Mint. If you have ever grown mint in your garden or thought it might make a nice ground cover for your landscape and you, you found out pretty quickly that it didn't work as well as you thought. And um, all of these plants are in the mint family. Uh, remember I talked about the sedges having um, uh, triangular stems? Plants in the mint family have square stems. And again, you can roll it between your fingers and you can tell that it's square. You know what's in the, I'm gonna sing for you. What's in the mint family is basil, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Not, not parsley, unfortunately, but those are all in the mint family. And if you ever see a plant that's getting out of control, check, check out the stem and see. Um, and so, so there are products for that. This is actually a ground cover one of my favorite ground covers called Ajuga. I'm gonna move myself over here. Um, Ajuga, and it comes anymore, it comes in such beautiful colors with nice little uh, blue flowers in the spring. Um, and uh, Burgundy Glow, one is called Caramel Toffee, I think. And uh, beautiful, beautiful ground covers. But see what happens now, this is, this is a juga right here, all planted in between the hostas and whatever else we've got here. Um, forest grass maybe, and, uh, and it definitely spreads um, and it becomes a weed. I, I always say ground cover covers ground. That's what it's meant to do. A lot of people don't realize that there is a product um, and the chemical name that I'm most familiar with, which is in that grass be gone, is fluazafop. Now you know why they don't call it that. It would, it would market it would be a bad name. Um, the the grass beater in the lower right corner. There are there are several, but a lot of people don't realize that there is a product. There are products that you could use to kill only grass. Well, we're familiar with the ones that kill everything, like the Roundups and whatever. Um, and then we know the broadleaf weed killers like Weed Be Gone, but a lot of people don't realize that there is just a specific grass killer that's considered a selective herbicide because it just kills one type of plant. Oh, this is interesting. It never occurred to me that maybe someone would think selective her herbicide might mean it will kill just the daisies, but not the marigolds or kill just the dandelions, but not the marigolds. And that's, it doesn't get that selective. It's just broadleaf or not broadleaf or grassy or both. So yeah, here's an example. Um, if you if your kids or grandkids or uh, children in your classroom have ever bought, brought you flowers, um, which one of those is a weed? As far as they're concerned, they are both really pretty flowers and they're giving you a gift. And nature does not see any difference between the two. Um, you've seen the leaves before on these, and these are both considered broadleaf plants, broadleaf plants. We only call the dandelion a weed because we don't want it in our lawn, but it is still considered a broadleaf plant. Now here on the left, we've got the real pretty ajuga that I really, really like, and it has escaped into my lawn in, in some places on the side of my house. And on the, on the right here, we've got uh, this with the little tiny white flowers is sweet woodruff. It's a, um, it's a ground cover. And uh, there's a saying among, among perennials, the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and then the third year it leaps. And that sweet woodruff has, is taking over a, a one, one of my flower beds. But you can see there's, um, there's Creeping Charlie in between there. So there's really no way to get, the, you can get the ajuga separated from the grass because in this case, you would get a selective herbicide that just kills broadleaf weeds. You might need the one with triclopyr in it if it's a hard to kill broadleaf weed. In this case here, the sweet woodruff as well as the creeping charlie are both broadleaf plants. I call the sweet woodruff a broadleaf perennial, a broadleaf ground cover. I call this a broadleaf weed, but they're still broadleaf plants. And there is no way to kill one of these without the other unless, uh, and Purdue Extension, I believe, still recommends just pulling it out and controlling it that way. Um, with some plants, people have been known to, to take a little paintbrush and spray the leaves on a plant if it's mixed in with something else. In a case like this, it, I think it's probably more trouble than it's worth. 
So here's the product I was mentioning, triclopyr. You'll see it in a lot of different products. And um, sometimes it's labeled as poison ivy killer or brush killer, um, chickweed, clover, and oxalis killer. Um, I have seen it once upon a time, there was a, a Roundup poison ivy killer, which basically was Roundup glyphosate mixed in with the triclopyr. Um, so you had a label tough brush killer or poison ivy killer. And that's, I call that like this, I would say that's the second step. Usually a, just a generic broadleaf weed killer will do mostly what you have to do. But if you have a, a stand of poison ivy somewhere, and I hope you don't, something like this we would have to be where you need to go. Now, that's not the only products out there. Uh, these are the ones that are most commonly available to residential, uh, reg residential use. Um, if you were to hire um, somebody to take care of your lawn or your landscaping, they have access to more things than you as a, a consumer would. And some of those things are only available to licensed applicators. So there again, I'm only showing the pictures for the sake of, um, well, and, and all these pictures are from either the brand name websites or from Home Depot and Lowe's uh, websites. But there's four different ways, unless there's another one that I don't know about, there's four different ways to apply. And the basic spray bottle is the easiest if you only have a few things. Um, and and, the, and I'm showing these two because you'll notice a lot of people will go, there's two different sizes. This bottle has, it actually has a, a, like a gallon and a third in it, but it also has a fancy sprayer with a battery and stuff. If you have a lot to do, that's probably the best. But ready to use, you just pick it up and spray. Um, you could use a concentrate in a sprayer um, and that usually winds up being a little cheaper. Now I, I showed this picture of 2,4-D down here to remind me to mention um, a lot of these weed uh, products, the broadleaf weed killers, like the spectricide weed stop and the ortho weed be gone and whatever else is out there. A lot of them have as their active ingredient, a chemical called 2,4-D. So you see this product here is like buying a generic brand of 2,4-D and that will help you save some money. Um, you have to mix it in a sprayer. If you ever happen to notice, and, and I've noticed this with Roundup, there's the Roundup that's 50%, Roundup that's 20%. And so there's bottles of it that'll be like $110 and it's very highly concentrate, concentrated. All that means is you're gonna add less water. It doesn't mean it's gonna kill anything better or faster, or it doesn't mean it's going to be stronger. You're just going to add less water to it. It's kind of like, how strong do you want your coffee? You know what I mean? Um, do you like it? Do you want it um, really, really dark or do you want it light? And the same thing with the sprayer, but if you have to mix it according to the package directions, if you were to put too much of the chemical in your sprayer thinking, oh, this is going to work that much faster, sometimes you'll kill maybe the top part of the plant before it has access or has the ability to go down into the root zone. So you always want to follow product labels. Read the label, make sure the product you're using is for the weed you're trying to kill and make sure it's not uh, that you follow the directions as far as keeping, usually it'll say keep children and pets off until it's dry, but always read the label. Um, there's a hose end sprayer, which is a concentrate as well. Concentrates are always a little cheaper uh, because you're not paying for all that water and this transportation to cart that water around, um, but you don't have to do any mixing. That's what I usually like to use. Uh, you have to be careful. Some products don't come in a hose end sprayer like that. And I wonder if it's because you really need to control it better. If you are spraying a weed control product on your lawn, which is about the only thing I do. I told you I don't do any much to my lawn. I put um, a broadleaf weed killer on my lawn and that's it. And I use a hose end spray. But what do you think will happen if you were to spray that weed killer uh, on a windy day it's gonna drift onto neighboring plants, maybe your neighbor's plants. Um, and it's, it's also gonna be very hard to control it out of you know, even the flower bed that you have right next to it. Um, so sometimes it's uh, the hose end sprayers can be a little bit um, trickier to use. And then of course there's putting something in a spreader. Like I said, a lot of those lawn care products have um, weed killers or like the first step crabgrass prevention, the second step the broadleaf weed killer, sometimes a broadleaf weed killer added to the fall step. 
and um, but always used in a spreader. Don't ever mix your fertile, unless it comes already mixed, don't ever put two products in a spreader uh, because it's very possible you'll get the settings wrong and have too much added. Okay, there are tricks to using non-selective herbicide in your landscapes. Like I said, if this weed that's down here, well, this is like a half dead looking weed already. Um, if, if you were to take that hose end sprayer and aim toward this, you are surely going to get the flowers off to the side here. Um, but some products come with this nice little, uh, suck, it looks like a suction cup, but it's not. It's just something to glom right up on top of that plant so you could spray it right where you want it. I've often recommended too, especially before this came out, um, is to take a box like this that's open on both ends and make like a little spraying booth. So you can see up in the corner here, I've got hostas, there's grassy weeds growing around here in front of it. Now, if I was very, very careful, I could probably spray those weeds. If it's not a really windy day, I might be able to spray those weeds without a cardboard box, but this is so much, um, has so much more control. You'll spray the inside of the box by accident, but it won't get on the plants. Okay, what about weed block? Oh, I am just not a fan. <laughs> if you are thinking about using weed block in your landscaping, I would suggest you go to YouTube and, or, or even just Google problems with landscaping fabric or problems with weed block. More than anything, this is what I usually see, this kind of thing up in the right corner. Um, there, this is actually a layer of weed block that has uh, the mulch on top of it has um, decomposed and there's stuff growing in it. So when they pulled it up like that, you could see there's the grass roots or whatever those weeds roots are growing right into the fabric and will take root into the ground. I do a lot of cashiering at work and whenever I see a customer coming with a, a roll of weed block or whatever you call it, landscaping fabric, I say, I gotta ask you, have you killed what's there first? Uh, and, they, and sometimes they'll say, oh yeah, I tilled it all up. And I go, oh, don't, if you till it all up, if it's a perennial weed like a dandelion, it's basically like dividing and multiplying. So like, just like you would divide a daylily or divide a hosta or any other plant, now you have made more of them and they are very tenacious. Unfortunately, the plants that we want to keep sometimes <laughs> won't do as well with the dividing or the whatever, but weeds seem to have, they're, they're very tenacious. And uh, some people ask about plastic, okay? Plastic might be nice in between rows of a vegetable garden, for example. I don't suggest it for your, um, your landscape flower beds or, or whatever, uh, because you want, um, you want moisture to be able to get into your plant's root zone. So unless you had a drip irrigation system by every single, by every single plant, and of course, in a flower bed, that's not necessarily practical. Um, so something that would let some moisture control at, is better than plastic. Now, you can use plastic to solarize weeds. And that's what that means is if you're, if you're going to be planting, say, a garden next year, or you're going to be doing something in the fall, doing some landscaping, you have time now, you could get real heavy, four to six mil heavy black plastic which uh, we don't even carry in our garden department. We, ha we have it in the paint department. I don't know if we have anything that heavy, um, but you can. it's available places. And basically what you do then is lay it on top of the weeds, leave it there for a long time. Um, I don't know if it's a couple of weeks, I think, in, on a hot, in hot weather. And that dark plastic then will bake the weeds that are in there. And that's called solarization. Um, and you don't want that to happen to your plants, of course, either. So uh, something like that, I suppose people put mulch on top of it. But um, I would really just stay, if you could, stay away from, um, this, is, this is another picture of what I often see with landscaping fabric. Here's another thought. With fabric, yes, you do have to put mulch on top over and over again. And that's what most people are trying to avoid when they use rock or the rubber mulch. Again, not a fan of that either. Um, but... Um, mulch at least adds to the soil structure as it decomposes and it allows the earthworms um, that are in the soil to uh, to break down that mulch and make your soil better so eventually your soil is just really really good um, 
So I was going to say something I forgot. I was going to say, oh, and some people think of rock that that's going to solve all their problems, but that doesn't either. Um, and I think part of it is like back here, you have, again, you have soil, the windborne soil or the mulch on top of the fabric that breaks down. And even here with rock, eventually wind blows in soil and you've got stuff landing on top and then there, it still winds up creating a place for weeds to grow. Okay, so back to my picture. Did I, I don't know if I showed you this. This was the back of my house when I had the patio removed and I let it go in one season. It, it had, it had, it had uh, concrete on it the season before, okay? So this is in one year's time, I think, or one season's time. I wanted to kill everything. Here's a method I used and uh, it worked very, very well. So down here on the bottom, um, I just put cardboard and uh, I wet it really good first. This, the patio or the flagstones are there just to hold it in place. I'll let it get really, really wet and then put mulch on top of it. And um, I don't know if that's the best picture, but it's the one I had. This is what it looks like now. Um, I've got some daylilies. Actually, I gave the daylilies away, so there's no daylilies now. Um, but that worked out really, really well. And the cardboard is a far better, um, far better because it decomposes and still allows rain to get through, water to get through. Like I said, do what you want. And, uh, and some people use landscaping fabric and it works out very well for them, but usually it only does well for a few years. Uh, look on YouTube for problems with landscaping fabrics and see. And that also brings me kind of side topic. Um, I have no, um, no edging, no plastic edging here. And that also, um, when I see people buying that, I, I wonder in a few years how well that's working because a lot of times that winds up, you know, you've got to dig the trench and put the, the, um, the border in there or whatever. And usually when I see it a few years later, it's kind of heaved out of the way. Um, winter dislodges it with the freezing and the thawing. Uh, mulch is I think just the best idea as far as uh, looks and adding to your soil health and everything. Actually, that's a very good picture. Nice picture, I can't say I did it. One last thing, always read the label. Um, I, I, I see people buying not just herbicides, but um, I see people buying things like uh, grub killer insecticide for the lawn. And uh, there are a lot of beneficial insects there. And uh, so I just don't recommend, um, <laughs> I don't wanna see you spend money that you don't need to spend for one thing, especially if you're buying something that's the wrong product, but also, um, you might be killing. You might be killing something you don't need to kill. You might be uh, might not even have grubs, and you're using something to kill grubs with. So always read the label. And uh, I think that is all I have. Uh, we do have a master gardener has a hotline that if you dial that number, have questions, they'll find somebody to answer it. Sometimes I get those questions, but um, anyway, I'm trying to think if I left anything out. Anybody have questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, you say you put the cardboard down. Did you pull the weeds up or did you spray the weeds or anything before you put the card cardboard That's good. down? That's a good question. I, um, I sprayed the weeds then. Yeah. I, okay. I, 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 my policy is, and I've learned this from Purdue, the judicious use of chemicals. So I use it when I have to. Uh, but by spraying everything the first time, and actually some of it, I wasn't real careful because I knew I was putting the cardboard over it, uh, but I got the major weeds out of it and then, um, and then put the cardboard on. That's a good question. Okay. Thank you. By the way, I'm recording this with just, I, I don't think anybody else's pictures will show if that's a concern. I'm trying to think if I have any, if I, if I forgot something that I wish I had mentioned. Anybody ever dealt with poison ivy? I've dealt with poison ivy. I own it. Oh, <laughs> we, we live on some acreage and uh, 
we have a ditch with poison ivy and that's not fun. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, one thing I also, I can't say that I do this, but I recommend it now because I did it the wrong way. Um, I, like I said, I've been busy the last few years. I've been working two jobs for the last 10 years and uh, I have a tendency to neglect things. So last summer I happened to be walking through my, um, my yard and discovered, uh, I think Virginia creeper getting tangled up in the yews. The, there's a hedge of yews between my house and my neighbors. Um, I also had a, a mock orange bush that I basically was able to prune by breaking apart with my bare hands. And so I think that if nothing else, it's probably a good idea to just see what you have. And I bet that's poison ivy is something you've got to, to stay on top of, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Have you, what have you been treated, trying to get rid of it with? Um, Rick would answer that. So my husband, oh, okay. he sprays gotcha. it. Um, with, I, I think it's poison ivy killer. I mean, it, it says poison ivy killer yeah. on the, the package, so. Well, I, I would be curious when you get home, maybe, you're, maybe you'll be curious too, to see if it's uh, triclopyr in there. Because that's, the, that's the, the chemical that I'm most familiar with for residential use that would kill, you know, be for brushy weeds. And now you got me curious. I have to admit, I'm more familiar with what's at Home Depot because I've been there so long mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, and I know there are a lot of other products out there, but the ortho products and um, spectricide and those are probably very common for customers anyway. I, I thought, oh, sorry. My name is Fran and I have dealt with poison ivy before. One of the best things I think it's how to get rid of it because it has very shallow roots and it's a, and it's a runner is to pull it up. Mm -hmm. And use gloves when you do it, of course, you know, and have some kind of long pants on so you don't get, get in touch with it, but to pull it and get and, and bag it, get rid of it. Yeah, and don't, and, I guess, and I, from what I understand, don't burn it or anything either because it's oh got no, right. volatile oil. Yeah, you it. could really set things off on burning it, but I, I have done that in the woods, and I mean, it was phenomenal you'd pull one the major plant and the roots came up from all directions and, and it, like I said it's a very very shallow root and okay. it took care of it you know Good. far more I, I then I used Roundup on it and that works but the thing of it is that you, that you need to get rid of the plant when you kill it you know so it's get what I think what half a dozen or another was it but yeah. I have good luck with it yeah. Sorry for barging in. No, no, Sorry. I'm I'm glad I'm glad I asked for uh, I asked for input, but you know that is interesting because like I mentioned the Virginia creeper that I discovered, you know I'm thinking oh my gosh what would have happened if I hadn't noticed that or hadn't looked at it or had not paid attention, um, and I actually had that first picture I showed at the very beginning of the English ivy that was made the ground cover but also went up over the trees several years several years ago well. I've lived in my house 30 years, so it's been about that long ago. I got some um, English ivy cuttings from a, from a landscaping job and thought, oh, cool, this will be neat up the side of my garage. Well, it did not take long for me to realize it was growing up over the concrete block garage into the garage under the between right. the block. And right. the, yeah. Right. And, um, but I was at that time, I was out in my yard all the time. My kids were growing up and I spent a lot of time in the yard and I was able to catch it right away. Um, but I don't know, like if I had walked away and didn't look at it for a year or two, you know, I don't know how that would have just been like those trees at the beginning picture. One of the things like with your Virginia creeper and with uh, your grapevine leaves, they'll kill a plant. You know, they'll kill, you know, it, 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 they're gone. Like str Virginia, strangle it, like. Virginia creeper is another one that you can really pull that up. And, but yeah. I don't, haven't done it, gone into the plant as well. But when I, I have a lot behind me that's so overgrown and I go out and, and start killing some of the stuff over there. And, uh, but you, you can control it, but like, and it also has the grapevine leaves going over there. So 
Uh, I have not tried to dig up, you know, or put any kind of chemical into the ground with it, but I just tame it out by by cutting it back, you know. Interesting. And a lot of those things too, if it's something that grows from seed, like pokeberry, for example, pokeberry is one, I'm trying to think of what else, um, that uh, nightshade that looks kind of like a tomato plant, but it's got little yellow, little, right? yeah, purple flowers. Those things, a lot of those things are, are growing again from seed the following year. So that's another reason to, right. try, to try to get on top of those things before they get out of control. Because if you let right. them go if, to seed, if, then... Now, another thing, I, it's not a weed, but it might as well be classified as one. No, I have the Rosa Sharon plants. And those are, those are one, you have a Rosa Sharon plant around, you have seedlings all over the place. Yes. Now, I, it, I, I've had taken and cut, you know, the uh, flowers off so it wouldn't <laughs> throw out the seeds. And it's, you still, you get them. And I, like I say, I, I didn't end up liking Rosa Sharon because they're too invasive. Yeah, and that is um, something that I suppose the pre-emergent, like if you were to use Preen or Weed Stop or any of those other products that will prevent weeds from growing from seed, um, that, that would avoid some of that problem. Now, I still have some weeds that pop up, but it's a, a, a huge difference fr um, from the time that I forget to use the Preen, like that back patio area. Right. Um, but yeah, so something like that that recedes. But even still, if I have a, a, a garden on the side of my house, on the side of my garage. And several years ago, somebody gave me, I thought it was Chinese lantern, but I think it's been, uh, someone told me now it's jewel weed. But so I don't know, it's a, but it's a plant. And whenever anybody says to you, oh, I have tons of this stuff at my house, would you like some? That's always a good sign that you should say no. Because right, if, right. If, yeah, if they're sharing something because they have some waste too much of it, there's good, there's a good reason they're sharing it and they mean well, but something like that, I'm still seeing things pop up um, <laughs> that's in the, what they call the soil bank on the side of right. my house that I planted 30 years ago and haven't seen since then. But for the most part, the pre-emergent takes care of it, but I still see a few of them pop up in between the, the evergreens. Well, you're the first person I've really heard talk about green, and I, it, it is something that I should get, okay? Never right because it seems like, like you say, there's things that, you know, 30 years ago, you pulled it out, and it's yeah. it, it built, showing its ugly head, right? Yeah. And, okay, all right, I'll let you get back to your thing. No, no, I, I'm appreciating the talk, and I think, I hope everybody's learning from this, but yeah, I, um, and I said, like, there's, there's other brands of it. Uh, I know at Home Depot, we sell Weed Stop by Spectracide. Oh, <laughs> Spectracide, yeah. Yes, and, and Preen. Preen's probably the most, um, uh, the most common, I suppose. But then again, at the independent garden centers, they will have brands that we don't have. Right. Um, and that's, uh, so just check it out. Look for a pre-emergent. And when it says pre-emergent, that means it, you put it on yeah. before the leaves emerge. Um, post-emergent, then it would be too late. So a lot of times people will say, oh, I put that on, it didn't work. Um, but if, if, you, if you put it on, like if you pull a dandelion and, um, you know, and it comes up later, it, it's not going to, it won't do anything for the dandelions. It just works on food. Actually, this is funny. When my daughter was little, she thought she was, I don't know what she thought she was doing. She planted grass seed in my flower bed. <laughs> oh, okay. And, you know, I just <laughs> saw it all dumped all over in one spot. And uh, I mean, I scraped up most of it I could, but then I went ahead and put the pre-emergent on real quick and never had a problem after that, so. Okay, that one sounds interesting. We, we don't know. <laughs> well, my son also, my also son also thought he was weeding the garden one day and uh, chopped down all the green beans when we had a vegetable garden, so. Uh, you were talking before about your uh, deer creeping Charlie. Uh, last year, I went a rampage to get rid of Creeping Charlie, and it's pretty well worked, okay? And uh, the Master Gardener's manual kind of says that if you want to get rid of Creeping Charlie, is to use it, uh, you know, the spray, right, or whatever it is, the weed and feed. And there's certain ones that do with Creeping Jenny and with Creeping Charlie, but to use it like in March, 
what I did last year, I had so much of it that I used some in September. October is the optimal months because like you said before, it soaks back down into the roots because it's taken feeding into the ground. And mm -hmm. then in March this year, I used it again. And I said, that was an overkill, but it has taken care of at least 95%. Nice, nice. And I mean, I had, I have a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I am going to be doing the same thing, you know, soon. And, you know, hitting spots that I didn't hit before. And, uh, but it works. That's a good idea. And actually, I, I, I suppose the, the idea of putting it on early in March is that all that stuff is tender new growth. Right, I, it's I before the new growth quit. But there. the thing of it is, is in they put, it's in October, and and it ended October because of killing, uh, getting into the rut. Any other time of the year is not good because once it gets old, it it sticks its tongue out at middle. <laughs> okay, you know, and it's a bad boy. Okay, yeah. but that, and I was real pleased with it. Good, good, good. You know, you bring up another good point though is um, that weeds like a lot of plants um slow down well like like just like we do slow down when it gets right. really, really hot and so um, right. a lot of the weed control products will say not to use it when it's over 70 degrees on a regular basis right. or something like that right yeah. and that's probably uh -huh. why because because if, if it's if it's slow i won't say dormant but kind of like it's going into summer dormancy it won't absorb those chemicals down into the roots as as well as it would um, but I had always thought that if we got rid of the weeds before August, would they really start to seed, that we would probably, you know, have a yeah. better hand on it too. Because when you look at all the flower seeds, well, what I look at in my flower seeds, plus mm. what I have a weed seed, it's something else, yeah. uh, you know, and get, a, you know, try to get a good handle on it. Yeah, good all point. Right. Okay. Yeah. Another thing that I just thought of too, a lot of times, um, and I know everybody's anxious to get on the, um, the weed control products, like even in April, you know, you start seeing dandelions, everything's dependent on weather. So if we have an early spring and you start seeing dandelions pop up in your lawn and people are anxious to get the weed control on then, um, and sometimes it's, it's usually too early um, and, and mostly because the plants are, you'll see some dandelions, but they are not actively growing yet. And they won't really start picking up until closer to uh, middle of May when, when frost is passed and, you know, we're ready to plant annuals. And so if you, if you use a weed control product, like let's say step two of, of those lawn care products, for example, that have the broadleaf weed control added to them, if you use them, then it's a very good possibility you'll still have some dandelions and other weeds that will come up later because they're coming up after that uh though those herbicides like the product that's in um let's say scott's uh step two weed and feed i think that's might be 2,4-D in there and those products are a post-emergent and they only kill what's already up and growing and um, right yeah and so so then you can always go afterwards with the little handheld sprayer or something and get what you missed i suppose well, you know, one of the things like with uh, using uh, Roundup to try to kill things once it's been up, it only just kills the top of the leaf. It doesn't really soak into the soil and get, every, you know, anything that, you know, else. We will go over and get the seeds, you know. Now what it just, it what are you trying to, what is it not working on? I'm sorry. Uh, with Roundup, when you use Roundup, it only is going to kill what's on top. It doesn't yeah. kill, kill anything, you know, anything else. Right. Now, that's why some of those products, like, uh, again, since we're talking about Roundup, but there are other products that have the same, they, ha they will have extended control, and then they have... Right. And then they have stuff added to it, so it's no longer just glyphosate. Some of those products you have to be more careful with. The, there's one that lasts for three months or something, but this is, I think this is interesting. Like if you want to prevent weeds in your driveway with a product like that, you obviously have to spray all the cracks in your driveway or all the cracks between all of your pavers. 
in order for it to do its job because it's not going to prevent anything, anything unless you spray it. So that's a case where I go, why don't you just wait and spray what comes up later rather than spraying everything to begin with. Um, but yeah, you might have to do it a second time or something. Yeah, but then there's also that uh, there's also a, a Roundup product that has like season long or something. And that, if you look at the back of the label, that's not that's used in far fewer instances. So like right. one of them, one of them you could spray around a tree to make a tree mowing ring, and I've done that before, uh, just to kill what's around the tree, like out about a foot, so my neighbor could mow my around my trees better. Um, but then there's other one that if you look on the back of the label, it doesn't even recommend using it that way. And that's because it's actually in order to make it a season long product, it's got something in that it is um, probably sterilizing the soil or, or it can get into, because um, a lot of these products, um, I, wanna, I hate to say for sure, because now I don't, don't want to speak out of turn, but Roundup, for example, goes into the plant, into the roots, but it does not translocate. They call translocation where it, so it doesn't go into the soil. It won't go from the dandelion into your daylilies next to it. It stays within the plant. Uh, but some of those long-term can affect plants around it. And there are also some weed control products that will, um, I think dicamba was one of them that they use in crops to kill weeds and that they have found damage to uh, landscaping plants and other crops, you know, quite a distance away because it, it's, uh, it, it, it's volatile, it disperses through the air. Wow, wow. I, I had not ever really uh, paid too much attention to, uh, you know, any kind of products that killed, but when you get some tough stuff, you, you revert to it. Yeah. And, and so uh, there's a lot of the, uh, you know, the chemicals that are available and I have not really done anything, you know, to do, you know, pay too much attention to any of them. I'm still learning. Okay. And that's why I say, and the, and for the Purdue, um, line, I guess you'd say, is the judicious use of chemicals. Use them when you need to. Don't use them when you don't need to. Um, yeah. And then just try to limit what you have to do. And I guess the, the pre-emergence are, for the most part, um, I think, safer than the post-emergence, something like preen. Um, but preen, by the way, works by creating kind of a gaseous layer right at the soil level. Okay. Um, and, and I, I heard one time now I, I, I don't know if I should keep this in the recording, because I just I, I don't have documentation on this. And as a teacher, I should know better. Um, but I heard once upon a time somebody using preen on the floor of a greenhouse. And, oh. that it, and then it caused interference with the germination of the plants on the tables. Wow, wow. That, that one's kind of scary, then, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, what do they say about having that around animals? Almost everything will say keep pets out of there until it's dry. Okay. Uh, all right. Because, you know, I would hope that it would be that, it, you know, uh, wouldn't be something that would interfere with that or with, you know, the birds or, you know, other kind of yeah. stuff around there. Yeah. Unfortunately, we, um, we like to have our yards landscaped and we want we want it to look a certain way and therefore it's like a trade-off um sometimes okay. i wonder sometimes i wonder as i'm driving around like what would this look like if everything was just left to its own devices oh you know what i like i said i have a lot behind my house and i feel like i'm living in a hole when i when everything grows up you know because it gets it gets five six you know foot tall and nothing flat and this mm -hmm. year even though we didn't have all the rain we still have a lot of growth, yeah. you know, I, that yes. really surprises me, you know, that we, we didn't have a stunt, stunted beginning mm -hmm. of the growth and the growing season. Yeah. You know, this might be a good time to also mention that there are a lot of plants that are, um, are imported, I guess you'd say, uh, they're non-native plants. And they, they came into our country to fill a landscaping need. You know, we wanted um, right. 
and we wanted uh, honeysuckle. We wanted, uh, well, even boxwoods not na not normally hardy in our area. It's not native to this area. Um, well, I'm thinking burning bush is another one. There's a lot of plants that are now on the invasive species list, no longer able to be sold in the state of Indiana. Burning wow. bush, is, yeah, burning bush is one of those plants. Um, the non-native honeysuckle, the euonymus, the little golden green and gold and emerald gaiety euonymus that people. Okay. Have, that's been a very popular landscape for years, and actually. Um, but flowering pear, calorie pear, is going to quickly be on that list, I'm sure, uh, because it's popping wow. up everywhere. And so, wow. um, so the use of native plants as much as possible. Uh, be thankful. I don't know if you've, any of you are familiar. And I've never lived in the South, and I don't want to deal with that. But there's a, pr a plant called kudzu, K-U-D-Z-U. That that's, uh, uh, that's a no-no. Yeah. That, that one's an absolute no, no. Yes. It's worse than, it is worse, I think, than what I was talking about before with the grape line and the Virginia creeper. Yeah. And it'll get, get up in the trees and kill them. And, <laughs> and most of that, I think, is more towards Florida. Yeah, that's in the south. And it's possibly Georgia that, that you know, not necessarily as far as Florida, but um, definitely like I want to say Georgia that area okay. all right and uh, yeah, but th yeah. thankfully not up here I'm guessing it would right. not be hardy up here or something hey, but it wouldn't take much to bring it up here what's that yeah. I said it wouldn't take much for it to bring up here yeah but maybe it's not hardy here maybe it's too cold uh I yeah that would be a blessing yeah <laughs> but that for those of you who don't know k-u-d-z-u is how it's spelled and it will grow like a foot a day from what I understand, something like that. If you leave your car parked too close to it for an extended length of time, it will grow over your car. It grows over oh, billboards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's something else. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Because this has been almost an hour. I feel like I should leave, let you guys go, but I appreciate your time. And I hope you learned something today. Uh, feel free to contact me. Um, I guess, uh, let's see, well, I am. I do have a YouTube channel, that Lynn Barbie channel right there, or the extension office can get a hold of me if you want. Um, I'm on Facebook if you want. Um, be happy to answer questions. I like talking about plants. What, uh, what home depot do you work at? Oh, sorry, the one on Route 30 in Hobart, Hobart Merrillville. Okay, I, I go there once in a while, okay. okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, Another thank question. you. Another question. Okay. When do you, when do you start selling um, cone flowers? We have them now. Most oh, garden centers, yeah, most garden centers will sell things when they are in bloom, which is why I always recommend going to, and I go to all the garden centers. I don't, I don't stick to just to home. I gotta see what everybody else has. And I right. shop at the local garden centers too. Uh, but most of the time they'll have something when it's in bloom, which is right about now. And um, okay. and so that's why it's a good idea to go to the garden center more often than just in the spring. A lot of people will be going in the spring. All right. And I could tell you're a gardener, so I know you'll be there more often. Oh, okay. I, anyway, I don't make it as often as I'd like. I'm afraid to go sometimes because you would really hurt yourself. You know, you see all these things. Oh, I want that. I want that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate the talk. Very informative.